The Periodic Effects Cannabis Business and Science Podcast is brought to you by Periodic Edibles, the Cannabis Caramel Company, available in Oregon. You, in fact, had a comment you wanted to make, Richard. Well, it's rather moved on. I mean, I was just going to say I can't imagine why anyone should think it was an ethical problem. I can see why they might think it was a Hello, welcome back to the Periodic Effects Podcast. My name is Wayne, and I'll be your host. I own and operate an edible business in the Oregon rec market, and the Periodic Effects Podcast will focus on the business and science of cannabis, and we upload new episodes every Monday night. And this episode is with Todd, the CEO of Harvest 360, and he's also on the board of the Veterans Cannabis Project. So Todd has a really interesting story. You know, he was in service for, I think, over 25 years, um, right around there, retired recently. During his time in service, um, overseas actually got involved on a with a hemp project, which was the first kind of exposure he had to the cannabis plant. Um, learned more and more about cannabis, was really, really interested around kind of brain trauma, CTEs, and traumatic injury. Um, we talk a little bit about that, some stories of, you know, someone he worked with who he lost uh, in the thought because of a brain injury that maybe hemp or these products could, as a neuroprotectant, have helped him. And also in the NFL and veterans, um, focusing on those two areas to help with a protocol he's developed. And uh, Harvest 360, he's setting up an international broker, um, basically firm to take products, brands, from the U.S., from other countries, export them. He's got a lot of experience in Europe. He traveled around there a lot while he was serving the country. And so a lot of great experience that Todd brings and has, and he shared his story with us, and I think you'll learn a few new things um, in this interview with Todd. Um, Todd and I recorded this on October 30th, 2018. And before we jump into this podcast, I just did want to say thank you to everyone um, in the last podcast that signed up for our email list, and we picked a few. We sent out a few emails. We'll be sending you our seasonal caramel flavor soon. We did a hazelnut and vanilla chai. Um, Those are non-cannabis, of course, but they are infused with terpenes. And we'll be getting feedback from uh, the people that signed up that we sent a note out to and excited to make the infused version of one of those two release it around Thanksgiving to Christmas. So just want to say thank you uh, for signing up for the list and also thank you for providing some feedback when we send you the caramels. Um, just wanted to mention that, so we'll get right into this episode with Todd, and uh, here we go. So to get started, I um, always just start with a simple introduction for listeners, so uh, name, company, and, and you got a couple different things going on, so I guess when people sure. ask, what do you do or what are you doing, what do you normally uh, tell people? Okay, yeah. So, well, I'm the CEO for Harvest 360. Um, the back end of my company is based in Denver, Colorado, and and I'm based in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so I'm the CEO of that company, but I'm also a board member on a 501c3 company called the Veterans Cannabis Project. Okay. And, you know, uh, being a veteran is something that is pretty recent for me because I just retired from the Army on January 1st of 2018. Okay. Um, I wore the uniform for 27 years, mm-hmm. and it's certainly a part of my DNA, and, and um, it's kind of an inspiration for me in terms of the, the population that I hope to serve, both active duty military personnel and especially the community that I'm now a part of, which is the veterans community, because I see that you know we're in <clears throat> a real veterans health care crisis and I'm trying to create a, an environment where we can provide really exceptional health care practices for veterans and and civilians alike. Yeah, and I'm excited to get into that because I think it's such a huge <clears throat> conversation to have right now and and you see it finally starting to pop up everywhere now with cannabis becoming more accepted. Um, so that'd be really interesting. I'd love to talk about that. How, how, Mm -hmm. when did you start Harvest 360 and how long have you been on the board, uh, for Veterans Cannabis Project? Uh, let's see, I think Harvest 360, I think we're about a year and a half old now. Um, I started that when I was still on active duty Mm. because, you know, I wanted to be able to consult on, uh, cannabis and cannabis issues around the globe. And, uh, I've been a member of the Veterans Cannabis Project for a about, I would say, just a little under a year. 
Okay. That's a, a great organization. It was started by this this guy named uh, Nick Etten, who is a Naval Academy grad. Mm. And, um, you know, so he served his country. I served my country. Uh, we have a bunch of guys who are all veterans. And our mission is really to kind of elevate the conversation of medical cannabis and, and what, it, what the potential is there uh, within Washington, you know, to really – walk the halls of our elected officials and talk to them about it um, and also to access the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense mm-hmm. where many of us um, still have a lot of a lot of close friends who are serving the country and that I think can can do with a lot of education and gain an understanding of, of what the potential is of medical cannabis. Mm. And when did Veterans Cannabis Project um, officially <laughs> launch? And, and so they're mostly focused on Washington right now. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, they're it's mostly they're mostly focused on on um, you know really moving the needle within Washington. Mm. And I think I think Nick's been doing this. He started this about two years ago. Okay. I, I can't I don't recall the exact date. Like I said, I've been with him for about 10 months or so mm. and um, doing really well. I mean, the, the purpose of of the uh, the organization was really to share some stories of veterans who are are receiving great benefit from medical cannabis mm. And also to kind of educate those who who are in positions to make decisions so that they can talk uh, from a position of education about medical cannabis. Yeah, yeah. I could all, and, and that makes sense, I think, focusing on a single state where you can use mm-hmm. it as a model and then into other states versus trying to take a national approach would just, I could imagine, be so overwhelming and difficult to gain traction on. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the approach we take is really that we have 30 states where you have medical cannabis access. However, veterans who, who you know, are in desperate need of it um, can't really have access to it without getting sideways with the Veterans Administration. Mm. So we want them to be able to talk about their cannabis use uh, with with uh, VA doctors and also, you know, really include that as part of of their health and wellness regime. Yeah, to even to not even be able to discuss it just seems ludicrous. And I think on top of that, you know, for people that are really in need, the consumption and the costs are extremely high, um, which, you know, you're covering all out of pocket. None of that's covered by health care, which I'd love to dive into, too. But let's back up a little bit. I would love to know how cannabis became a part of your life and your career because i think when most people Mm -hmm. you know in the army for 27 years um successful career there they think probably conservative and probably anti-cannabis so i think you're an amazing spokesperson advocate because you have a foot in both worlds but how were you initially introduced to cannabis and did you have Mm -hmm. that stigma in the past that cannabis was you know a bad thing sure i mean you know i although i grew up in california Um, I grew up in a very conservative household. My stepfather was a a sheriff's deputy. My mom worked for the sheriff's department, Mm. obviously very anti-cannabis, you know, and I'm, I'm also part of the just say no dare generation. Um, my, my real father is a rancher in central California and the cowboy culture is really anti-cannabis or at least it certainly was when I when I grew up and you know that even though that's kind of changing which is really exciting we can (laughs) we can talk about that a bit Um, so that's kind of the the environment that I grew up in and obviously then at, at 19 years old I enlisted in the army and I was I was in an environment where you know the the quality of my character was judged by the content of my urine as 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 my good friend Russ Belleville will always say and and I I really believe that that is uh something that has had a negative effect um not only in industry but certainly within the military yeah so yeah. I was I was kind of uh, anti-cannabis even though you know I dabbled in it as a high schooler um you know but it, but it was nothing nothing serious it wasn't a serious part of my life mm-hmm. Well, I later on, I, after I enlisted, I went to the West Point prep school and then I went to West Point. Um, I studied there for four years. I, when I graduated, I was commissioned as an armor officer and I served in two different combat arms units, one in Fort Riley, Kansas, another in, uh, Schweinfurt, Germany. 
<clears throat> and then I became a foreign area officer. And uh, foreign area officers or FAOs are kind of a special branch of the army where we train army officers to to be str- strategic scouts, essentially, mm-hmm. to serve as advisors to our nation's ambassadors that run the embassies in those countries mm-hmm. or in foreign countries, and also to general officers, general staffs, international military staffs, and things of that nature. So we get trained on the history and the culture and the languages of particular regions. Yeah. I was very lucky because my region was Europe because I already spoke uh, a handful of European languages and then the army taught me a few more. Mm. And um, so that was real. That was really my career. I served in six different countries in Europe. Um, and like I said, the army taught me five languages, but one of the most, I guess, um, compelling or the, one, one of the positions that affected me the most actually was in Afghanistan. Um, I was asked to come out and be a special advisor to the commander of the International Security Assistance Forces in Afghanistan. So essentially the, the four-star general who was running the entire coalition, which was the largest military coalition that has ever existed to this day with 50 nations involved. And, uh, you know, I was asked to kind of help manage the relationship with the coalition. Um, So really kind of taking into account all of the stakeholders and what their initiatives were, what their objectives were in Afghanistan and and fighting alongside of us. Um, And so while I was doing that, though, the the commander asked us, you know, we had the small staff asked us to kind of come up with some creative ways to create an industry for the Afghans using the resources that they had. Mm -hmm. And among their resources were minerals, very rare minerals that China owns, you know, China bought them all, bought the rights to all of them. Mm -hmm. So that was of no use to us. And then they had heroin, obviously, or a lot of poppy, and I didn't have much use for that or a recommendation for that. And then they had cannabis, which they grow in huge numbers, you know, large amounts of cannabis being grown throughout Afghanistan, you know, home of the Hindu Kush. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, maybe we could kind of change the angle on that and transition them to a hemp industry with it being an industrial product, not a drug, you know, 25,000 different uses and almost five to 8,000 years of human history. Um, we've been involved with this plant. I, I feel like we've probably evolved with the plant, uh, to some extent, if you look at some of the history books. And so I thought this would be a great commodity for them. Uh, to be able to have this industry where, you know, you can grow it with very little water, very little pesticides. Uh, we could provide processing materials for them. And, and the bonus would be that growing hemp around cannabis that's grown for hash and THC would crossbreed and weaken the THC level, would garner less profit in a prohibition market, you know, and those, those profits were – we wanted to, to lower those profits because those profits typically would fund the Taliban and um, be the source of improvised explosive devices, which were, were killing uh, huge numbers of coalition forces. So I thought it was kind of a genius idea, you know, a win, win-win for everybody. And, and it was looked at as kind of a, you know, stoner recommendation or a Cheech and Chong scenario that, uh, that, and they looked for other options. So what year was this? This was in 2011. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so it was really unique um, because I, you know, by doing just a short study on this, I started listening to a few podcasts. I started reading a lot of books and materials. And I saw very quickly that there were potentially military applications, not only to hemp, but especially to cannabis. Um, I was running across stories of veterans across the board who were getting great relief from pain and chronic pain issues and reducing their use of opioids. Um, I saw people who were treating their symptoms of post-traumatic stress to great effect and I thought this is something that that we could really use in the military and in the veteran community. Um, and then when I came across the fact that the government owns a patent for cannabinoids as a neuroprotectant, anti-inflammatory, and an antioxidant, I thought that would be a phenomenal way to address um, traumatic brain injury. 
You know, um, traumatic brain injury is something that affects many, many active duty military personnel, especially in combat. And six out of every 10 traumatic brain injuries that are sustained in combat are sustained by army personnel. Mm. Um, there was one in particular that, that affects me to this day. Um, it, I did not endure it, uh, but an officer that worked for me who was also a West Point graduate um, was in Iraq. I was not there. I had left command at this point. And my unit had deployed to Iraq. And there was a young officer. His name was Andy Houghton. Um, from Houston, Texas, and he sustained a traumatic brain injury from a rocket propelled grenade yeah. that struck him in the head. And he, you know, our battlefield medicine today has advanced so much that they were able to stabilize him on the, on our vehicle or on the vehicle and evacuate him the entire time. You know, the brain swells and has this effect called the a cascade effect that takes place where glutamate and cytokines and proteins are emitted from the brain and cause irreversible damage. Mm. But they were able to stabilize him. They did a soldier to soldier transfusion. They eventually got him back to Walter Reed Army Medical Center where uh, they stabilized him temporarily, um, had to remove a portion of his brain we pinned a purple heart on him there, and then the next day he passed away, and it was mm. it was really kind of devastating for me to know that you know he had been in my command, and then he goes to combat, and and unfortunately sustains a um, a deadly wound. But I wanted to put this neuroprotective capability to work on behalf of soldiers and increase the survivability of soldiers in combat. So uh, I came up with this strategy that we call the Athena Protocol. Mm. And the Athena protocol is really a, um, a strategy to mitigate and treat traumatic brain injury using non-psychoactive cannabinoids in, in a couple of different phases, which go from, you know, phase one is, is a supplement phase where we maximize neural protection through cannabinoids. Uh, and then a second phase, which happens right of the boom, as we say in the military, which is after an, an IED explosion goes off where you're typically surrounded by comrades who are, are injured or unconscious and, uh, and, and the effects of a traumatic brain injury are already ensuing. So the ability to administer non-psychoactive cannabinoids on the battlefield is something that I believe would be able to um, begin the anti-inflammatory process early mm -hmm. and potentially arrest the expression of um, proteins and other chemicals that are damaging to the brain. Uh, there's a follow-on phase, a third phase that would be administered by a medical professional where we're proposing the monitoring of intracranial pressure and the administration of non-psychoactive cannabinoids to control the pressure so that they can hopefully go without, um, you know, the barbaric methodologies that we use today of burring holes in people's heads mm -hmm. to release pressure and, uh, often ends in infection or death. Mm -hmm. And, and finally the fourth phase is, uh, really the most exciting phase, I think, which is uh, a rehabilitative phase mm -hmm. that we've proposed, which would include cannabinoid therapies, um, omega fatty acids, uh, diet, exercise, physical therapy, talk therapy, and things of that nature to bring a victim back to full cognition. And, and, and that's, that's in short, the Athena protocol. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we're talking about with the DOD and with the Veterans Administration, um, as well as other, uh, other companies around the country, hoping to get some traction with it. Because I think it's a, a, a way for us to look at traumatic brain injury in a couple of different phases and continue to improve that over time. I think we could, like I said, really increase the survivability of soldiers in combat. Mm. And I, I also think it would be effective in potentially mitigating and treating chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE, which is what many of our professional athletes suffer mm. from, especially our football players, our MMA fighters, our, our professional cowboys, you know, who, who ride in the professional rodeos uh, around the country. So yeah, that's, that's kind of a big push for us. Yeah, no, and I, I, I definitely want to 
get into the Athena protocol and how that was developed and where, where it's at right now. It's very interesting um, and clearly see the application. To back up a little bit, during that time of finding those studies and working on the hemp project in 2011 and then starting to find cannabis studies and the neuroprotectant mm-hmm. capabilities and you're learning about all this, how was it, you know, I'm just curious about the conversation with your peers at that time, or as you started to learn a bit about the history of cannabis and maybe how it was made illegal, how was it having that conversation and presenting those new ideas or those studies? Was that, was that a lot of friction in that process? Uh, rarely. Really? Um, okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we breed in our military, very critical thinkers, mm. right? I mean, we are trained. Um, one of the things they would, that they taught us, all the time at West Point was, you know, our imagination was our only limit and that we had to be critical thinkers about uh, complex issues so that we could come up with creative solutions to solve them. And so that's, you know, that's the type of mindset that we've been armed with. So, so once I learned more about it, you know, when I made that presentation in or recommendation really in Afghanistan, I was still poorly undereducated about this plant. Mm. Um, and you know, that's what drew me to the research first, as you, as you mentioned, I, I noted that the roots of our own prohibition were incredibly racist, um, and economically and greed motivated. Mm. And, and, you know, the effects of it were, were very similar to slavery in that, um, you know, it was the, the prohibition, the prohibition laws had been applied to minority communities mm-hmm. in an unequal manner. You know, I'm certainly not saying anything new here, but it's but it seemed to me to be inherently un-American and and not really representative of the country that I had signed up to defend. Um, you know, it's not and it's not to say that I'm not incredibly proud of my service, but it seemed to be something that was inherently anti-American and, and, and a social justice issue that I felt I could sink my teeth into and, and hopefully change. Um, and then when I, you know, when I would study the science of the plant, I would bring all of these things to the table in my conversation. You know, I started challenging myself, actually. I just started reading everything that I could. And I started talking to close colleagues and confidants about it and encouraging them to do some reading as well. And and they did. And we would have some really great discussions about it. Um, and then I started challenging myself to discuss it with my leadership. Mm. So I made a challenge to myself to, you know, every time I saw a general officer, we were going to talk about weed, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what was really unique is when I was really like deep into it my, was the, my second to last duty station. I was the, um, senior defense official and defense attache to Slovenia. Mm which is a small European country you may know and the European Union and just a beautiful place. And they have a state partnership program with the Colorado National Guard. So that means that I watched from Slovenia as Colorado legalized marijuana for adult use. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I had two Colorado National Guardsmen who were working for me during that time frame. And we would talk about the effects of of legalization in their state. And so it was it was really unique. But whenever general officers would come and visit us from Colorado, I would always open up the conversation with them and ask them what their what their views were on it. And it was interesting because no one really had a negative view or they would have a a view based on their assumptions about what was going on. Mm -hmm. But because I was listening to great podcasts, um, uh, you know, I, I was armed with data Mm -hmm. and I was able to talk to them about, about data that was coming out of like the national traffic safety administration and, and what was going on with driving or what was going on with violent crime in, in Colorado, what was happening in terms of tax revenue and kind of bring it back to that. And, and then also talk about the social justice impacts because, you know, in the army we are, or in the military, we are inherently concerned with liberty and the defense of liberty. And, you know, so this subject really crosses all of those sectors. 
Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting to hear. I think from an outsider's perspective and a misconception that, you know, I would have or other people as you think of, you know, cops, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, just inherently anti-cannabis. That's the message you're delivered and that's what you follow out with. But it's really great to hear that, you know, there's this focus on, you know, I mean, and it makes sense over, you have to be creative, a problem solver, self-educated and sufficient that way. But it sounds like you have a group of people that are, you know, self-aware and educated looking around like, you know, this really doesn't make sense. But at the same time, you know, the army has to work in alignment. So if there's an order or a, a process that has to be followed or for cops, these are the laws. You don't get to make your own self-judgment in the moments about, you know, do I arrest this guy for you know, an eighth of weed or not. And there's the mm-hmm. whole, you know, discrimination thing, um, yeah. which is huge, but yeah, it's so interesting. And, and like, again, for you to be an advocate and, and been in that world and now this world, I think bridging that gap is, it's just amazing. And it's so good to hear. Um, thank you. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm really interested in building bridges, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, that, that as I was in Slovenia, I, and I knew really that I wanted to be a part of this industry. I saw how it was evolving and how, interesting and exciting it would be um and and how much good i believe that that can be done with this industry i was trying to figure out how the heck am i going to transition from being a military officer you know especially a military diplomat into into working in the cannabis industry and so i came up with this concept to to do exactly what i was doing for the department of defense um which is really forwarding national security strategy policies as well as uh, Department of State and foreign policies in European countries. And I thought, well, the United States is evolving state by state. Canada was evolving very, very rapidly. And I thought maybe I could and, – and at the same time, many European countries have begun to, to look at medical cannabis and you know they're evolving very rapidly. And I thought, well, it would be great to kind of forward – the the strategic objectives of North American cannabis companies in Europe, mm. because that's ultimately where I want to end up. I, I really enjoy Europe. But yeah. um, for the moment, you know, I think I've got a lot of work to do here in the United States and North America in general. Yeah. And so that's Harvest 360, the business. That's where the idea came from. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And so, that's really kind of evolved over time as well. Yeah, I, I could only imagine. You know, we're in Oregon, an isolated state, and our business is constantly evolving. Looking at international trade and brokering and, and those relationships, I mean, that's just just getting off the ground with Canada going, Canada going wreck, and these exports are starting to happen. Um, that's really interesting. So where is Harvest 360 at, and how is the landscape evolving for you? Mm -hmm. Um, So what we're doing now is I'm really trying to create research platforms for the cannabis space. Um, And and by that, I mean state by state, we're creating research platforms and research opportunities with some uh, specialized technology and software that we have. Mm. And and I'll talk about those in in just a sec. But we've been writing applications. Um, We wrote along with a company called Blue Diamond Ventures, we wrote a winning application in Virginia for a company called Dharma Pharmaceuticals, which will which will establish a medical cannabis facility in Bristol, Virginia, which is right along the uh, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee border area, right? And it, it's interesting because if you look on a heat map, it's like the center of the opioid crisis. Oh, it's at really? the top of the, it's at the top of the Appalachian Mountains it's uh, right along the I-81 corridor, and it's just a space that has really been devastated by uh, the opioid crisis. So it's going to be cool to see what it looks like when we drop a cannabis bomb right in the middle of that, and hopefully, hopefully, we'll see a, you know a replication of what we've seen in many other states, where it's you know a reduction of about 25% in opioid deaths, and you know a reduction in opioid prescriptions upwards of 10%. Mm. So and, and, you know, the ability to create jobs in that place um, and the, the ability to educate people in that area, mm-hmm. I think, is going to be really unique, really unique experience that I'm excited to be a part of. Um, we also partnered with a woman named Wanda James um, from Simply Pure Colorado. We created a company called Simply Pure New Jersey, and we submitted an application there. 
um, for one of the one of the six uh, medical cannabis licenses that that are going to be awarded to supplement the six medical cannabis licenses that are already there. Okay. Um, if you know anything about Wanda, she's a phenomenal person. She's uh, she runs Simply Pure in Colorado. Her and her husband Scott, uh, they're both. Na- uh, she's a Navy veteran, uh, former Navy officer. You know, no one's perfect. You know, I try to hang around army people, but these Navy <laughs> people just keep showing up. Yeah. Uh, her husband, Scott, is a Marine. And uh, we create, we put together a really phenomenal team that is just, you know, representative of of the society in spaces where we were applying in New Jersey, right? So everyone, either uh, minority, a female, a veteran, or sometimes all three, you know, but I mean, beyond that, beyond just what we look like, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a team, each one of us a complete and total professional that has experience in the industry and has um, a set of values and goals that that we're trying to achieve there. And that in that space, we would create another research platform. Um, research priorities for us will be treatment of pain, reduction of opioid usage, uh, treatment of symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And I always break it out into symptoms, you know, um, Mm -hmm. insomnia and anxiety, depression, things of that nature, because post-traumatic stress is such a complex beast. But I think cannabis is going to be a really exceptional tool to address, um, many of those issues. And then finally, um, in, in both of those places, I'll be looking to treat, uh, traumatic brain injury and develop aspects of the Athena protocol. Mm. So, so, and, I, and I'm sorry, and I just want to say that it we'll also be pursuing a license um, in some form or fashion in my home state now of Missouri. Okay. Um, it's not my native state, but it is where I live today. And Missouri is going to vote on November 6th. Uh, you know, just next week, we're going to vote for medical cannabis. And I've been a big part of the um, of the campaign to legalize medical cannabis here. And we've put forward amendment two Mm -hmm. through new approach, Missouri, which is just a really phenomenal. It's probably the best medical cannabis program that I have seen in the United States at this point. Interesting. Now, Wanda and simply peer, are they, are they growing um, retail, making processing value added products? What's their focus? Oh yeah, absolutely. They, so in, in Colorado, I believe she has two separate dispensaries, but they have a grow, they process, they make edibles. Okay. Um, her husband, Scott, is a, a trained Jamaican chef. So their passion is really um, edible products awesome. that are of high quality, tested, standardized, and uh, that's that's really their main focus. But yeah, they do grow grow there. In New Jersey, we, um, we partnered with uh, a, a company called... Uh, a group called, uh, I'm sorry, with Al Harrington, um, who is a former NBA player, and they're going to be condu- they're going to be doing our uh, cultivation, processing, and extraction. Okay, is that Viola? Is that his that's, brand? That's correct. That's okay. correct. Yeah, that's Viola Labs. Okay. Um, and they're a multi-state operator at this point. And Viola Labs, they're true professionals. So they'll be doing all of our cultivation, extraction, and processing for us. Okay. So if I'm connecting the dots here, it sounds like developing these relationships with brands and you know key players that are building solid companies and a foundation that in mm-hmm. the future with Harvest 360, the potential to take those products basically – outside of the U.S. or export um, Europe, potentially other places. Is that kind of the long picture idea? Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, really developing these brands. Um, and, and we have another vehicle. We have, we have Harvest 360 Tech as well, which is really how we would execute that. Harvest 360 Tech is our joint venture. Um, we partnered with um, a, a guy named Clement Hayes, from Block 45 Legal in Denver, Colorado. He is our patent attorney. Okay. Uh, we also have Steve Baugh from Chemistry Mapping. He is one of our scientists. Um, he's a chemist who brings with him um, some great technology that I'll talk about. Uh, and we also have a, another chemist, a big data specialist, a geneticist. Uh, my chief medical advisor in Harvest 360 Tech 
is a fellow named Dr. Philip Blair, who actually lives there in Oregon with you. Um, Dr. Blair is a 72 graduate from West Point as well, and um, you know served a full career in the military and then did a family practice and focuses now solely on cannabinoid medicines. Okay. Um, and then Harvest 360 we would be kind of the marketing strategy mm. team, the leadership element uh, of this. And, and the concept is that we would take people's intellectual property patent it for them or trademark it for them, protect it, and then license it for use mm. in other states and eventually in other countries. Okay. Now, I, I kind of want to ask a technical question here. I, I heard you say partnered with um, on Harvest 360 Tech with the IP mm-hmm. attorney. Is that an approach businesses will take when you know there's going to be a lot of IP and patents, and if you were to pay an attorney to do all that, I mean, the cost would be substantial. So do you find an attorney and bring give equity, basically, so that they can run that part of the business when you don't need to raise a million dollars to be able to cover those costs? Is that how that kind of works? Yeah, I mean that's that's the way we've done it, yeah. and I'm, I think it would be a path for others in the future. Um, we did it that way. I mean, everyone in my company, we're sweating, we're sweating like crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. And but it's but it's e- it feels easy to do mm-hmm. because w- what we did is you know we've tested whether or not we all have the same values, goals, and objectives and visions for the future of cannabis, and we all came up with a resounding yes, mm-hmm. and and that's why it's so easy to work with these folks. I, I think we're very close to um, being capitalized in some form or manner, and and really employing all of the talents that we have coalesced in that one one company. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to hit on the new technologies and discuss that. But before we – on that one, I want to back up a little bit. You talked about uh, Missouri and rolling out potentially the best medical program you've seen mm-hmm. and then states that are highly restrictive um, mainly on the East Coast and then Colorado, which is now REC and a much lower barrier to entry. How do you view these different markets? And when you have a business model like Simply Peer in Colorado and you take that to New Jersey, <clears throat> when the marks, markets are so different – um, how do you compare and contrast, you know, a highly restricted medical market versus a low barrier to entry recreational market? And, and I guess, how do you manage that landscape? Mm-hmm. Well, for me, you know, I, I just spoke in Israel a couple of weeks ago. I went out to the Canex thing and I got to, it, it was a really great conference where I got to meet a lot of superheroes, you know, and Dr. Mashulam spoke and, and Dr. Abrams was out there, all of these amazing people. Um, and the question that of the panel that I sat on was, you know, does the, uh, oh, and by the way, you know, the, the following day, Canada was going to legalize mm. cannabis for adult use. So the big question for everyone was, you know, is medical cannabis dead because legal cannabis is here? Um, my answer to that was a resounding no. I, I believe that, you know, cannabis poses um, the option for a true paradigm shift in healthcare mm. and the way we mitigate and treat illness and the way we mitigate and treat disease and injury. Um, so I think that there's so much to do in terms of research that the future is wide open for us, right? I think yeah. the quick buck today is going to be um, the the adult use market and the but the long term gain if someone's looking to to make money is in the the medical cannabis side mm-hmm. and and by the way that's not why i'm in this game at all i hope you can tell by what <laughs> yeah, i'm saying yeah. um but but yeah i think the long term gain and and the rich rewards of satisfaction and and legacy that we might be able to leave for our species is in medical cannabis and and really helping facilitate that shift this new paradigm shift for healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. I I completely agree. And from the scientific side, even if cannabis was legalized recreationally across the globe, I mean, there's Mm -hmm. still so much to be done with medicinal research of the plant and the profiles. And there's so many different ailments that it could cover and what works best for what. But I guess from the business side, yeah, you know, yeah, that how, was your question. I'm yeah, sorry, how do you look at really merging those it. markets or the potential of federal legalization? I just wonder how those two markets will clash when they come together and potentially could tra- trade across state lines. So I think that that's going to be up to like individual operators to make an assessment of what their end goal is in in being part of the industry. If it's to make um, the largest amount of money that you can make, then, you know, you're gonna have to make your assessment on what the market share is and, uh, 
going to be in place, what regula- regulatory policies you'll you'll be required to adhere to, um, and what that's going to look like in terms of cost. That's not what I look at. Um, I look at the potential to have better patient outcomes. Um, I look at the potential to affect particular regions or or even as close to cities um, or states that I possibly can. You know, that I, I told you why I'm excited about Virginia, because I think that we can really do a deep dive into what the effects of medical cannabis will be in terms of serving as an exit drug and helping us um, escape from this opioid crisis that we're in. Yeah. Um, and I really look at New Jersey as the potential for us to um, kind of change change the conversation in terms of social justice and give um, minorities in the state of New Jersey a seat at the table to be a part of this industry and to be a positive part of of the state that they live in or the city or the community that they live in, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the bonus of New Jersey is also that it is part of this, you know, Ivy League corridor where you have phenomenal, like world renowned researchers who are eager to conduct research on medical cannabis. Um, you also have the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, you have like the, the, the largest concentration of phar- ph- pharmaceutical um, companies after Massachusetts. Actually, Massachusetts is, is, is the most densely populated in terms of pharmaceuticals. Okay. Uh, but New Jersey is the second. But New Jersey is also um, led by Governor Phil Murphy, who ran on uh, legalization for adult use mm-hmm. and has also opened up the potential for more medical cannabis uh, facilities. That's why we submitted a license. Mm-hmm. And and what's interesting about Governor Phil Murphy is he was also a diplomat, right? His His job prior to being governor was he was the ambassador to Germany. And so he understands a little bit about um, international trade, uh, international research, and recognizes that the the cannabis industry is the future, and we have to be prepared for uh, international trade and research in the, in in these products, you know, especially at a medicinal level. Yeah. So I think that's what's exciting. Yeah. What's exciting for me about Missouri? Um, this is a state of six million people not big, but it also has 450,000 veterans living in it. Mm. Um, and this is a demographic that I am a proud part of. And it's a demographic that I want to help, uh, both medically with, um, access to high grade medical cannabis in all of its forms, right? From flour to oils to topicals and edibles and things of that nature. Um, but it's also a place where I want to employ veterans. Um, that's, that's one of the big things for me, um, you know, in a state where we have 450,000 veterans, uh, around 7% of them are unemployed. Mm -hmm. And I think that the cannabis industry is a space that is ripe for, uh, veteran participation, right? Every, operator, every dispensary owner, every cultivator that I ever speak to says that they want to hire veterans, but they don't know how to access them. Mm. And I want to create a platform where they can access them, where where we can train them and bring them into the industry. Because, I mean, they're the perfect employee, right? They're trainable, they're disciplined, they are experienced, uh, they they know how to work as a team. And, and I think most people would agree that they'd be a really phenomenal addition to, to any part there, uh, of the industry. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it, with your, you know, strong network and I'm, I'm assuming you have a lot of conversations with government officials and people in that system. Is there any talk or word around federal legalization or moving steps, even for declassification in the United States right now? I mean, we have so many states that are medical, over half, recreational is coming online in multiple states. Is that conversation happening in the halls of the federal government? I think so, yeah. I mean, you know, most politicians are recognizing that cannabis is way more popular than they are. And this is no longer a fringe issue, right? Yeah, I mean, no. you know, your grandma is asking you questions about it at, at Thanksgiving. And yeah. uh, this is not a fringe issue. And this is an opportunity for 
uh, even conservative politicians to kind of look a little edgy, you know, a little sexy and and say that they're, you know, out of the box thinkers. And um, I think it's going to happen sooner than we think. Mm. I, I don't have any inside information if, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> well, but, yeah, if you got but, it. <laughs> but, I, but I do know that, you know, I mean, with, as part of the Veterans Cannabis Project, I did um, coordinate and, and participate in a meeting with the Veterans Administration Division for Research and Development. And they were incredibly welcoming. They were very warm, and they recognized that the the team around the table were allies who want the same who want the same thing that they do, and that is the best medical care possible for veterans, um, and and a common recognition that we're in a veterans healthcare crisis. And and you know I think what we were bringing to the table for them was experience and a level of education both socially and scientifically on cannabis that they maybe had never heard before. Um, we also brought to their attention that other other strong allies and partners of the United States, um, such as you know, on there, these are strong NATO allies, for example, from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, such as Canada, who provides medical cannabis for their veterans, um, and Germany, the Czech Republic, Holland, or the Netherlands, uh, all provide medical cannabis for their veterans. And the same thing takes place in Israel, which is obviously kind of the home of uh, cannabis research. Yeah. Yeah. That, and I think people look at cannabis right now and they're like, you know, it, it's obvious this can do something. And then, you know, you look at the VA or why isn't it happening? And I, I think, too, it's important to remember that. I mean, this is a huge system and they can't just flip on a dime and change things overnight. I can only imagine the, um, you know, in any system that big, the bureaucracy and working through things or new programs to put in place. Just it takes a, a long time. Mm -hmm. Do you predict or see that, you know, eventually maybe for veterans that cannabis would be covered for medicinal reasons or even covered by health care in the future for people um, that have a medicinal need for it? Yes, absolutely. I do. I, I do foresee that in the future. Um, you know, I think this is a way to reduce health care costs mm. in, in a huge way. Um, this is a major disruptor for the health care industry. And uh, I mean, when we can grow our own medicine within our own country and provide it to um, our citizens, I think this is a huge cost benefit mm. that is, go is going to be grasped on, grasped on very, very quickly. Well, be relatively quickly. <laughs> Not quickly enough, but relatively quickly. Well, because it, it, it's that kind of disruptor and has that potential – what resistance do you think is going to come from the pharmaceutical industry? Are they going? To, is it going to be open arms because it's got this potential, or are they going to put up roadblocks intentionally to try to slow it down because it's a threat to their business model? Well, in my view, the smart pharmaceutical company is looking very closely at cannabis mm -hmm. and recognizing that the old rubric of using synthetic monomolecule approaches to addressing really complex um, medical issues yeah. it, it has severe negative side effects, positive side effects if you're an investor in that company, mm -hmm. but negative side effects if you're on the receiving end as a patient um, and as a society in general. Obviously, we've seen that through through opioids and 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 other drugs that have had uh, negative impacts. Um, when when I talk to healthcare providers, I always ask them, like, you must be incredibly excited about cannabis and, mm -hmm. and what the potential is there. And they're like, no, it's going to lead to opioids. <laughs> I'm like, so we're just going to start them off with opioids, right? Great. Um, and so I always talk to them about like this mono pharmaceutical approach that they've been trained in, mm -hmm. you know, and that we've been training for like 70 years in our country and give them – the analogy of, you know, they are likely experts in their field, meaning that if they were an artist, they would be a Picasso or a Renoir or someone who is a master in their field and knows how to work with a certain palette of colors. Mm. Well, cannabis, in my view, is an entirely new palette of colors or and materials that we're able to hand this artist mm. and and um, and and work at their métier. Right. So the ability for us to apply 
uh, cannabinoid formulations that are naturally extracted from the cannabis plant and uh, put back together in a recombinant format that can replicate cannabis and cannabis strains, I think is, is a huge potential for uh, medical application. Right. Yeah. And so a lot of people, you know, when I talk about the pharmaceutical industry, a lot of my friends, my close friends who are, are, you know, cannabis activists and cannabis purists kind of cringe. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that, that looking at it that way, it, it does, it doesn't preclude uh, whole flower cannabis. And, and, you know, we've brought some technology to the table that, that allows us to characterize whole flower cannabis, like taking all of this complexity of up to 120 or 130 cannabinoids, depending on who you talk to, all of the terpene profiles and characterizing that and providing some specificity to that where, um, doctors and researchers can then apply or collect patient data feedback and input to these particular um, cannabinoid formulations. And then eventually we'll be able to replicate those through natural cannabinoid recombinations. Yeah. And get some predictability because that's what doctors miss. They're like, wow, I, I don't know how to deal with weed. You know, I can't tell grandma to go smoke green crack for OG Kush. Not to mention, you know, OG Kush on the West Coast is going to be different from OG oh, yeah. Kush on the East Coast. And then and then we bring up genetics. Mm -hmm. Well, genetics is also, I mean, that's a it's a wonderful way to look at the plant. Um, you know, it shows the complexity of the plant in terms of genetic makeup. There are 20, 20 genetic markers in, in the cannabis plant where there's 23 in us. So it's a very complex issue, complex plant. But when we can provide that simplicity for researchers, it makes them feel a little bit more comfortable with it. Um, like they can actually, uh, get some data out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I had, um, a couple episodes ago, Dr. Pollock on from Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm, University, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with him. And, and that's one yep. thing we discussed was the, you know, kind of Western medical approach, which is isolated compounds, studying those one at a time and how cannabis, you know, there's synthetic THC, but it's reported doesn't work nearly as well, causes nausea in some mm -hmm. people. And so how do you test and verify this plant that has 150 different compounds in it all working at once? Um, it's yeah. a very interesting challenge. And, and so we talked about some new technology. Technologies, and it sounds like you were kind of alluding to that, that you're going to simplify that or maybe have some solutions around it. What, mm -hmm. um, what are you working on or what new technologies are you really excited about? Sure. Well, this this is one that we would certainly employ in um, in New Jersey, Virginia and Missouri and anywhere else. I mean, people can certainly license it. Um, so we, we have this concept or not this concept. We have a technology that's already working um, that is essentially chemistry mapping. And it's, it's a methodology of characterizing this complex cannabis plant and mapping it on a 3D map, you know, with an X, Y, and Z axis okay. um, onto a single point, meaning that this one flower, for example, that has 27% uh, THC and, you know, 1% CBD and, you know, has CBN and CBG or any other cannabinoids in there, as well as a range of different terpenes mm -hmm. and, um, and phytocannabinoids in the plant. And we can, we do three separate chemistry analysis of the plant, um, overlay that with, uh, an algorithm that then is able to map it onto this, uh, onto a 3D map on the X, Y, and Z axis, right? So providing this specificity. Mm -hmm. and then we connect this with back-end software that allows a doctor and a patient to have a conversation and provide feedback to that patient's response to that particular sample of cannabis. Okay. And that, within that, we'll be mapping the, the effects of the complex flower. I see. So it's really creating this map that identifies this strain and profile is almost exactly the same as this one, and then using that in the field to tie it to what ailments does that data point or that strain profile really help or work for, and then mass data basically to create that um, system. Is that, is that that's, accurate? That's Perfect. Yeah, cool. it's absolutely accurate. And then, you know, we envision applying AI 
technologies to that. And once we have multiple data sets, you know, as, as I think we'll get more and more clarity over time as we have more and more sample sets that we'll be able to um, – apply artificial intelligence to it and make predictive analysis on what might be able to address, say, chronic pain and anxiety simultaneously. Yeah, we had um, Dr. A.D. Poe on. Uh, oh, she's wonderful. Another yeah. Missourian, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think it was episode 21. Um, mm -hmm. if, if people haven't listened, she's a neuroscientist, PhD, and doing something kind of similar, building an app to basically get big data from mm -hmm. um and it sounds like maybe she's more recreational patients or medicinal use but what is this strain and profile helping you for um and kind of trying to aggregate that data in a in a similar way um, maybe with a different approach but fascinating mm -hmm. way to approach it and it makes sense I, I can't see any other way when you can't isolate one compound and say it works for this you have to have a new approach and it sounds like western medicine is this is maybe a new paradigm shift or a way of dealing with um, medicinal research that hasn't really been approached in this way before yeah I, i'm just i'm just hoping for the policies in the united states to advance quickly enough so that we aren't left in the dust yeah. you know because once we yeah. put the the research machine that that is resident in the United States mm -hmm. um, on this, I believe we're going to make advances very, very quickly. And if there are any tools or technology or relationships that that um, that I can leverage to make that happen, uh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Because for me, um, the ability to increase survivability of soldiers in combat is paramount the ability to address the veterans health issue that is uh you know that we're currently in the midst of and the opioid crisis that my country is in the middle of mm -hmm. if i can if i can move the needle on that and make it a better place for anyone then i think i'm doing my job yeah yeah let's come back to the athena protocol and i mm -hmm. would love to know where where is that at in the process or i guess maybe a better question is what's missing or what studies are needed still in I guess where's it at in, in the integration process? Is it is it close? Um, is it is it a few years out? Uh, where's it, where's it at? Well, it's it's a few years out because I'm trying to find a place for it to reside. Mm. Um, my my hope is that it can reside in a research institution in the United States um, that includes participation from the Department of Defense, which is is you know who I really care to to benefit from this first first and foremost um i think that there there could be a potential as well for say the national football league to be interested in this and yeah. and to do some you know to support some of the research in this um i think new jersey is a perfect place for that as as well since so being so close to nfl headquarters in new york mm. uh because i'm trying to provide a solution um, to a problem that the that the NFL has, and that yeah. is also it also exists in in MMA fighting and UFC and in and, and boxing and in pro rodeo, um, and and I've put it into a format. I always talk about the non psychoactive cannabinoids mm -hmm. because you know it's a bit more palatable for folks. You know, even though I'm a I'm a fan of the entire plant, and I want to honor the plant in in everything that I do. Uh, but I make it palatable like that because if the NFL can support it, the soccer mom can support it, the DOD can support it, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and that's really where I want to get to so that we can get to yes as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that you need that organization or infrastructure that can take the protocol and implement it across mm -hmm. the board and then you're – you're off and running. There's your test model, just like focusing on Washington State with the with the Veterans Cannabis Project. Um, mm -hmm. One area niche, show it works, and then yeah, spread it out. That's interesting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and and the complexity of it is because it requires like this multidisciplinary approach. You know, mm -hmm. this is we're talking about integrating uh, policy shifts, social yeah. and societal shifts, medical shifts in thinking um all to come up with with this with this program uh but i think i think we're getting close um there are critical thinkers at work within within the dod and within the government itself and i think that there are uh potentially uh large donors who would be interested in supporting an, an initiative of this sort 
What um so around the Athena protocol and using different products and you mentioned the four stages before, mm-hmm. during, after, and the recovery re- rehabilitation. Um, have studies been done specifically on the Athena protocol or studies that would apply to it? And is there any kind of relative um, drugs or compounds or methods that would relate to cannabis showing its effectiveness over this current approach or anything like that? Um, well, you know, I lean, I lean heavily, you know, I always look towards the, the, uh, Department of Health and Human Services patent Mm -hmm. on, on cannabinoids as a neuroprotectant, anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant. But there are a number of, um, studies that have been done mostly in Israel. Uh, two weeks ago, I was able to speak with um, one of the doctors who's kind of a, a protege of Dr. Mashulam at Technion Institute. Um, her name was Dr. Esti Shahami, and she is a true professional, and she works uh, significantly in traumatic brain injury and has done research on cannabinoids as a neuroprotectant, mostly in a synthetic format initially, which is not my approach, um, but I but I believe doing this with naturally extracted cannabinoids um, would have similar effect. Yeah. And, and so while I was in Israel, I was also able to um, observe some, some technology that is able to monitor the brain in real time and measure neuroplasticity and show changes in neuroplasticity in real time. Um, for example, this is a, it's kind of a helmet type of thing. You know, you can imagine it sounds very sciencey with wires and all this stuff mm-hmm. sticking out of it. Yeah. But, um, you know, they showed me videos of, uh, people wearing this and what the image looked like on the screen. And then with the addition of cannabinoids, how the neuroplasticity mm. is, is returned almost immediately. So that was very inspiring to watch that. And I think it's something that, that will allow us to collect data on this and, and show the efficacy of our approach. Yeah. What year was that patent um, by the United States filed or awarded? Oh, you man, now we're getting me into dates. I want <laughs> to say it's like, ago, wasn't I it? want to, no, I want to say it's 94. 94. Maybe. Jeez, okay. like it's 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 patent number 6630507. I'm sure <laughs> your listeners will be able to come up with that date immediately, but I want to say it's 94. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was in the 90s. Um so I get I'm I'm fascinated by this. How does the government file for this patent get it awarded for these reasons, these medicinal mm-hmm. benefits? <laughs> and it's still Schedule One, which the definition is no medical application. I mean, that's completely conflicting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's and 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 actually, the I think the I think the DEA was sued by the Hip Industries Association oh. just a few years ago, <laughs> um, under the the specific auspices, and they lost. You know, um, but but I mean, how do they how do they award a an FDA approval for Epidiolex from GW Pharmaceuticals? And still say that cannabis has no medical benefit and high potential for abuse. It's it's just it, it's really unnerving. You know, it's, it's the, really frustrating for anyone it, working in the space. Is the process to deschedule just that hard and intensive and too many approvals to get it to go, or is it something that could happen overnight potentially? Well. No, I don't think that that I'm not sure that it could happen overnight. Okay. I, I've I've heard tale that you know the president has the ability to uh, deschedule or reschedule. Um, there are a number of different arguments, and I'm not an attorney, nor am I a doctor. What the hell am I doing talking here? <laughs> no, <laughs> but yeah. but but really, um, it's it's pretty complicated. I would say that there are, are a lot of politicians who would get in the way, mm-hmm. um, basically, so. because if they didn't, they would probably lose a lot of uh, donations Funding. to their campaigns. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, I have the same conflict. I pay, you know, as the we have an edible business, and I pay federal taxes. And but for the longest time, getting a bank (laughs) account was the hardest thing to do because they were worried the federal government would shut them down if they worked with a cannabis business. And I'm like, well, they're taking my tax money, so I don't understand. Is that not laundering or what's going on here? I'm Mm -hmm. so confused, but. Uh, yeah, <laughs> nothing's ever nothing's ever perfect. So <laughs> we're making progress, though. Yeah, exactly. As long as long as we have constant forward motion, yeah. and you know, I think we. For me, the end goal in mind is 
to retire one day in the long, far, far future, but having left a positive mark on our society by creating and being part of a really responsible and respectable cannabis industry that, as I said, will be this, you know, the provide the impetus for multiple paradigm shifts simultaneously. Yeah. And, and to be clear, those paradigm shifts are in social justice, right? Once we take away the number one reason why um, African Americans and Hispanics are often thrown up against the wall and having their pockets emptied out, mm-hmm. um, you know, because having their Fourth Amendment rights violated, because, you know, once we make cannabis legal, the smell of cannabis is no longer a reason for anyone to do that. Mm-hmm. So social justice is a big piece. Um, economics, uh, in terms of tax revenue that will be generated from the cannabis industry, it's 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 going to be a major contributor to our our society, both on the state level and eventually on the federal level. Um, and you know, we're also going to create hundreds and thousands of jobs in you know state by state because we are we're really building an industry from the underground up. You know, this is an industry that has it that has existed since the beginning of prohibition, and if we are able to elevate it and really reward the employees um, that are working for us, and and put people to work where where they are paying taxes, but where they also have uh, things like health insurance, mm-hmm. you know, and retirement plans, all of those things make could make this a really phenomenal industry. Um, the third. The third major paradigm shift, in my view, will be in agriculture. Hmm. Yeah. Right. The infrastructure. So, or, yeah. Well, in a, in a number of different ways, um, because of this plant that we focus so closely on, we're really making some efficiencies in cultivating this plant. Right. We're we're looking at reducing costs, the use of water, the use of electricity, and and keeping it as natural as possible. Um, you know, everyone has always told me that big ag has so much to teach us about growing plants, but I think it's absolutely the opposite way. I think that we have a lot to teach big ag. And if we can transition and transfer some of these efficiencies um, to to big agriculture, I think that we can begin growing more food indoors mm-hmm. and move that food production closer to population centers and reduce the carbon impact of of food cultivation and change the way we feed our societies. I think that's a big piece. And I think that's, I think that goes to kind of changing the infrastructure in mm-hmm. some cities, basically making cities of the future out of the cities of the past using um, current and existing infrastructure like shopping malls, for example, which are which which remain abandoned around our country because no one wants to go to a shopping mall anymore. My proposal is why don't we start growing food in those spaces so that we can have hyper local food in our in our um, shopping centers, our shop or grocery stores. Yeah, that's interesting. I think with you know agriculture or new technologies anywhere, you could talk about the electric car and you see this mm-hmm. new technology or hemp for fiber or cement and you're like, well, this is better. It's more sustainable. It's lower cost. But I, I think you sometimes forget about the amount of infrastructure that's in place and you know what it took to get to that point and just to change technologies where that infrastructure is now obsolete. I mean, that's such a long process in and of itself. Um, so that, that shift in how we decide to run agriculture and grow our food and all the other things that come with it um, mm-hmm. is fascinating. And I could just only imagine the potential and new ways of doing things now that, you know, especially with the internet and how fast progress is moving just in general. Um, it's very exciting times and yeah, living through the absolutely. middle of history. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and so that in that fourth paradigm shift, I think we've already discussed, which is, is health and welfare mm. and the way we will treat patients in the future with cannabis as, as a first first line resort rather than the last resort. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Todd, thank you so much for coming on today. Before I ask where people can find you or, or what you're mm-hmm. working on, um, I normally ask guests if they're if they're hiring. I'm not sure if Harvest 360 or you're looking to hire outside help right now, but if you are, you could mention that. But is there any other projects or initiatives that people, listeners might um, want to get involved with or would be a good fit for? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I would say that, you know, if you are are a veteran or interested in, in forwarding um, veterans initiatives, especially access to medical cannabis, mm-hmm. you know, please look to the Veterans Cannabis Project. 
Um, we're always looking for donations, and those donations essentially go towards uh, bringing veterans to Washington so that they can tell their stories to decision makers because the stories are what are going to change minds and change yeah. policy. Um, is, is Harvest 360 uh, hiring? It kind of depends on where, where we are. <laughs> you know, we're, we're certainly going to be building out uh, facilities in Virginia, building out in New Jersey, hopefully if we are awarded a license for Simply Pure New Jersey, um, and then eventually in, in Missouri. But right now we're kind of uh, – we're pretty nimble right now. We're small and nimble, but I believe that we're going to have an expansion here very soon. And um, you can find me on at harvest360.co, okay. and you can find me on LinkedIn. Everywhere is by my real name. I'm, I've started to tweet and everything now. You know, so, yeah. so, <laughs> I I probably need to up my Instagram game because I'm told that the the cannabis industry lives on Instagram. But I don't grow any flowers. I I, I do, but I do love that flower. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, I would say that. I always end all of my conversations or, or presentations or speeches or discussions with folks in that if you're making a dime today um, in the cannabis industry, I would ask that people continue to give money to an activist and support activism around the country, even in states where it is legal, uh, because you know it's not perfect yet. And those activists and the the underground that brought us here, we, we owe a great debt to mm -hmm. because they risked their time and in many cases their freedom to bring us to where we are today through a lot of hard work. So I'm incredibly grateful to them and, and stand in awe uh, of those types of people. And I'm, I'm proud to consider myself an, an activist today. If you're in Missouri, come on out in, on November 6th and vote um, to, to put amendment to um, to the forefront and make medical cannabis legal in, in the state of Missouri. All right. Yeah. All right, Todd. Well, again, thanks so much for coming on. I mean, I really appreciate you sharing your story and your past experience. And now, you know, activist and educator around cannabis is it's so needed and it's huge. And I just really appreciate what you're doing. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Wayne, for, for the platform. Thanks for what you do, because giving us a voice, um, and, and talking about this industry is what's going to make it really, really great. I mean, if there's anything that can make uh, America great again, it's cannabis. And, uh, <laughs> that campaign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You have a wonderful day and, you, and thanks again. You, Take you, care. Todd, thanks. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hopefully you enjoyed that one with Todd. Um, we'll put in, uh, links to his company, Harvest 360 and the cannabis, um, veterans cannabis project in the show notes. If you want to follow up and look into those, learn more um, check out the show notes on our website and that's it for this week so thanks so much for tuning in again again and like i said in the intro thank you if you signed up for our email list we're going to be sending out or already have sent out our seasonal r&d flavor batches we did um, so we'll be excited to get some feedback from you on those and that's it so we upload new episodes every monday night if you enjoyed this podcast um, on iTunes, leave us a review, rating, and subscribe. We would greatly appreciate it. And that's it for this week. So we'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you, everybody. The ideas presented in this podcast are meant for general informational purposes only and should not be considered professional advice. The Periodic Effects podcast, Periodic Edibles, and all affiliated subsidiaries disclaim any liability for any damages arising out of reliance on the information presented. Please consult licensed professionals for any medical, legal, or business advice.